In this video, we will cover part one of enteral nutrition. A bit of history and overview, contraindications, patient selection, considerations, and medication and uh, complications and monitoring. Enteral nutrition, also known as tube feeding, has been attempted for centuries. Ancient Egyptians used reeds and animal bladders to feed patients a mixture of wine, chicken broth, and raw eggs. In 1793, an early healer delivered jelly, eggs, milk, sugar, and wine to a patient through a hollow whalebone covered with eel skin, which was pushed down the throat to the stomach. Even rectal nutrition delivery was attempted in Egypt, and for President James Garfield, who was shot in 1881 and was kept alive for 79 days on a mix of beef broth and whiskey fed via rectal tube. Enteral formulas were initially made by the hospital dietary departments from Whole Foods. These were pureed and delivered by gravity bolus through large bore tubes. The advantages of those feedings is that they were inexpensive and the patient got the benefit of phytochemicals in food and fiber. Unfortunately, those tubes would clog and there was a high risk of contamination and a lack of product standardization, so we weren't really sure exactly how much the patient was receiving. In the last 20 or 30 years, advances have been made so that we have standard formulas from the 1970s, and today we have feedings that are based on pathophysiology. There are specialty formulas for diabetes, kidney failure, respiratory failure, formulas that promote wound healing, and many others. Interestingly, there has been some research in tube-fed children who are intolerant of all formulas. We've been uh, actually using this in my practice. I work uh, in pediatric specialty clinics. We've had a couple of children come through who were completely intolerant to any type of formula. So we went back to the uh, pureed food in a tube. There, uh, is some published research on it but very scant so we published our case study and the little bit of literature that we could find. So there uh, you may see a revival of interest in this and I know that there's a following on the internet of families and caregivers particularly of children with developmental disabilities who do provide um, their tube feeding with whole foods that have been blenderized. So what is the uh, starting point or what indications are there that an enteral feeding should be used? Well, we start with a nutrition screen to identify potential nutrition-related complications. These include wound infection, delayed wound healing, an increased length of stay, respiratory infection, weight change, changes in oral food and beverage intake or tolerance to feeding, and med surge history. Nutrition screening is mandated by Joint Commission because of the strong link between nutrition status and hospitalization outcome. Screening should identify patients who are malnourished or likely to become so because of nutrition-related complications that are presented on this slide. For example, a recent unintended weight loss of 10 to 20 percent is representative of acute malnutrition. Weight history or weight change is usually a part of the nutrition screening process. Facilities often develop screening pro protocols to catch those patients who are at nutritional risk, and these are typically completed by nursing when patients are admitted to facilities. Enteral nutrition can prevent or treat the two major types of malnutrition, protein calorie malnutrition, known as marasmus, or protein malnutrition, which is failure to provide adequate protein which is followed by tissue catabolism, and the symptoms are more subtle. Hospital studies have shown that almost half of patients have a high likelihood of malnutrition and extended hospital stays are associated with increased risk of malnutrition. Additional risks and complications of malnutrition include impaired host defenses and sepsis, impaired wound healing and anemia, impaired GI function, 
muscle atrophy, reduced cardiac function and respiratory function, reduced renal function, decreased brain dysfunction, delayed bone callus formation, and atrophic skin leading to breakdown and pressure wounds. Of course, enteral nutrition offers benefits beyond just preventing or treating malnutrition. Proven benefits of tube feeding are included on this reference slide. However, there are potential contraindications. Enteral nutrition may be contraindicated with GI obstruction, intractable vomiting or diarrhea, severe short bowel syndrome, although many with short bowel can still successfully be treated with enteral nutrition, persistent postoperative ileus, and I want to point out that the absence of bowel sounds does not preclude the use of enteral nutrition. Distal high output fistulas, a severe GI bleed, malabsorption, inability to access the GI tract, and if the need is less than five to seven days for a malnourished patient or seven to 10 days for a nourished patient. Aggressive nutrition therapy may not be wanted by a patient or proxy. Looking at patient selection and considerations, we'll start with the ICU. Enteral nutrition can be used in the critically ill patient if special considerations are followed. Enteral nutrition should be delayed until the patient is volume resuscitated, hemodynamically stable, there's uh, indication of mesenteric perfusion restored to reduce ischemia. Clinical indicators of this condition include reduction in fluid and blood requirements, stabilization of vital signs, a mean arterial pressure between 65 to 70 millimeters of mercury, normalization of the base deficit or lactate, and discontinuation of inotropic or vasopressor support. Aspen guidelines call for the decision to feed to be made within the first 24 to 48 hours of admission. We would start the patient at 15 mils per hour and advance 15 mils every eight hours if tolerated up to 60 mils an hour. Permissive underfeeding does offer some benefit in selected critically ill patients. Nutrition support should be provided for all patients unable to eat for 7 to 14 days. It's important to assess the GI tract. Remember, we check for bowel sounds, although absence of bowel sounds is not, um, does not prohibit the use of the gut. We also are looking for a soft, non-distended abdomen passage of stool, hemodynamic stability as the gut is very highly perfused. Benefits of enteral nutrition can be realized even with 70 to 80 percent of nutrition provided per tube and assuring that there's early introduction. Enteral nutrition is a must for burn patients with more than 25% of total body surface area involvement. Some studies show 15 to 20%. Enteral nutrition can reduce infectious complications and should be initiated within 24 hours on post-burn patients. This is a 17-year-old admitted some years ago to an ICU he was post-burn from smoking a cigarette near a gas pump. Notice the NG tube was placed for gastric decompression soon after he was admitted. However, it was not used for feeding because the patient was able to eat by mouth. The second picture is one month after eating ad lib. The graph breakdown in malnutrition is obvious. Two months later, malnutrition has taken its toll. A nasogastric feeding tube was placed, but it was too late and the patient died the next day. Malnutrition is present in 50% of patients with congestive heart failure. Compromised systemic circulation associated with cardiac failure does not preclude the use of a tube feeding. Enteral nutrition should be started cautiously with care to prevent fluid overload and to not tax the respiratory system.
These patients should also be carefully monitored for refeeding syndrome. Nursing and healthcare providers should carefully monitor potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, and glucose. Interval nutrition can help prevent malnutrition and support the high calorie needs of the respiratory muscles and prevent pressure wounds in these patients. We typically use a two cal formula, but we'll get to that later. Cancer patients and those in the CCU, as previously discussed, can benefit from interval nutrition as these patients have high circulating levels of inflammatory cytokines that are known to increase protein catabolism and prevent healing. GI diseases such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis often present with malnutrition that can be attenuated with enteral feeding. Patients with fistulas in the esophagus, stomach, or duodenum can tolerate enteral nutrition. Tube feeding can combat malnutrition that's present many times in liver disease. Patients with neurological impairment, such as dysphagia secondary to a stroke, are beneficial and usually given transpalorically to prevent aspiration. Historically, patients with acute pancreatitis were fed TPN to rest the gut. We now know that tube feeding fed into the jejunum results in better patient outcomes compared to TPN. Dialysis patients suffer from malnutrition and end-stage renal disease in up to half of cases. Tube feeding is associated with improvements in these patients. Research has also demonstrated that tube feeding given prior to surgery or just tube feeding products can reduce healing time, complications, and length of stay in the post-op period. Most facilities use decision trees or algorithms to help guide decisions regarding tube feeding placement. NG tubes are generally given for short-term feeding and that's defined as less than four weeks. Pegs or surgically placed tubes are given for long-term. Another consideration besides the time of feeding that's anticipated is the patient condition. Small bowel feedings are recommended for patients at risk for aspiration. This includes conditions that might be seen in critical patients decreased level of consciousness, persistent high gastric residuals, vomiting, pancreatitis, patients with poor gastric motility, and others. There are pros and cons of gastric and small bowel feedings that are presented on the next slide. If a stomach works, use it. The advantages of feeding into the stomach include that tubes are easier to place and replace. We can use larger bore tubes and have less risk of occlusion. We have a broader formula choice and pumps are not usually needed. However, some patients can't tolerate gastric feedings due to gastroparesis or gastric ileus in surgeries and sepsis. Patients may need small bowel feedings if they have persistent gastroesophageal reflux, pancreatitis, and risk for aspiration or ileus. Nasogastric and oral gastric tubes are easier to insert and can be placed at the bedside by a trained nurse. In some situations, uh, registered dietitians are also trained to place nasogastric tube feedings. This illustration shows the most common types of tube placement for short and long term feeding. Commonly used in long term is the PEG tube. Patients will need to learn how to uh, take care of the tube site and how to aspirate and measure the water in the balloon to prevent leakage and potential infection. Here's an illustration of a jejunostomy tube. These are delivered via a surgical opening from the abdominal wall into the jejunum. Sometimes they may be introduced through a peg with an extension or even an NJ tube can be used. Surgical is the preferred route for a J feeding. Tubing considerations include type, length, and size. 
Early tubes were PVC rubber or latex. They were inexpensive and well tolerated, but the problem is that they became brittle due to exposure to stomach acid and had to be replaced frequently. Today we have polyurethane and silicone. Polyurethane is often used in gastric and small bowel feedings. They last a long time, they're strong, and they have a large internal diameter. The downside is that they're stiffer than silicone, and so they're not as comfortable for patients. Silicone tubes can be used for gastric and small bowel feedings. They're softer, more comfortable, but the lumen collapses easily when aspirating content. Length depends on the side of the feeding. It can range from anywhere between 36 inches for a gastric tube to 60 inches for a J tube. Size. Greater than 14 French tubes are usually stiff and uncomfortable. Some states actually prohibit their use unless medically documented as necessary. They were used historically for NG placement because of easy insertion. They were less likely to clog and easy to check for aspirate. But I well remember those days when we actually had loss of tissue around the nose and mouth because of long-term use of these tubes. Small bore 8 to 10 French size tubes are made of softer polyurethane materials and they're more comfortable for the patients. They do require a while style it to insert and many are flimsy and easy to mouth position. Smaller tubes are prone to clogging, especially if more medication delivery is needed. Standard flushing procedures are needed to prevent malocclusion. Gastrostomy tubes tend to be 20 to 28 French and jejunostomy tubes tend to be 5 to 15, 16 French. A continuous drip administration is best used in transpyloric feeding where a slow delivery rate is needed because the patient is intolerant of large volumes. This method may decrease the risk of aspiration but does require a pump and long times of feeding on that pump. The patient will likely need acid reducing agents and promotility agents to uh, decrease the acidity of the stomach and to uh, prevent aspiration. Bolus or intermittent feedings are used in gastric feeding, ambulatory patients who can protect their airway. It allows for more freedom and time off the pump and is more physiologically comparable to eating set times of a day. Bolus gastrostomy feeding can also be given by bag or syringe with gravity flow instead of a pump. 